Hello, I'm Chris Jackson, the uh, Vice President of Business Development for ETC Group, and I'm joined by my associate, Brian Lang, our engineering department lead. Uh, we're with ETC Group. Uh, I've been with the company for 14 years, and I hired Brian about six years ago. Uh, we perform energy efficiency work and commissioning work. Uh, we deal with a lot of retro commissioning of existing buildings, and we've seen all sorts of mechanical systems and vintages. Uh, Brian and I are located out of Arizona, but our company is generally based out of the Southwest US. Over the years, we've been involved with more and more flat plate heat exchangers, uh, also known as waterside economizers. And we've observed that they can be a common problem in central plant operation. Uh, we've developed a set of best practices to sequence and troubleshoot these systems to attain improved and sustained operation. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, here are the learning objectives from the ASHRAE list that apply to our discussion. Uh, today, Brian and I will be focusing on the last one. And here's an outline of the uh, material we intend to cover. Basically, we're going to look at a specific system type, step into economizer mode, discuss how to run during flat plate operation, and then stage back out. We don't have a lot of time in this session, but we'll provide our contact information and some useful links afterwards, and we'll be available during the Q&A. So with that, I will hand it off to Brian to run through some of the system details. Thanks, Chris. So here's an example schematic of the kind of chilled water plant that we're going to be talking about. I know it's a little tough to see uh, right now in this slide. So we're going to jump forward a little bit to see both sides of the system, the chilled water and the condenser water sides. So we know that there are a ton of different layouts and piping configurations and equipment connections that uh, that are out there in existing buildings. And so we're just gonna be focusing on this specific one. So here we see the chilled water side, it's pretty standard. The thing to note here is that the heat exchanger is in full parallel with the chillers. Basically it's piped up exactly like any of the other chillers, except that it's a flat plate heat exchanger and not an actual chiller. So in this is the condenser water side. It gets into the crux of what we're focusing on today. You can see from the schematic, there's no isolation for the heat exchanger. The heat exchanger is getting the exact same water as the chillers are. There's no way to separate it into a cold sump. And this is a really common layout here, especially in the Southwest US. And it leads to some specific problems. So you can see this is what our focus is. There's no ability to isolate the heat exchanger and we've got a shared sump for all the cooling towers. And generally it's pretty large, um, a decently large reservoir. So it takes a long time to cool, long time to heat, long time to see changes in the temperature going through. And it's, there's not a lot you can do about it. You know, it's a slow moving system. And so next we're gonna talk about some of the common issues that we see with these layouts specifically. So for this talk, we've compiled a list of common issues that we've seen or heard uh, when looking at waterside economizer systems. Uh, of course, there are the occasional physical issues that will prevent or limit operations, but uh, we'll save those for another presentation. Uh, the last one I do want to focus on, we often hear that the flat plate is undersized. Uh, this is occasionally true if there are some of the physical issues noted above or in certain cases, there have been significant additions to facilities over time and the flat plate wasn't upgraded to keep up. Uh, however, in our experiences, when you have an undersized flat plate, that is typically an air side issue uh, where you've got a winter load that's higher than it should be due to a number of things, including false loading, failed air side economizers or excessive airflow. Uh, also, we'll save those things uh, for another presentation, and for this one, we'll focus on the four lower bullets, uh, which are usually correctable control issues. So moving on, the first one, it's never cold enough outside. Uh, this is the first hurdle for staging into economizer mode. Uh, the biggest issue here is typically a lack of a chilled water temperature reset. A lot of the facilities we see use a constant chilled water temperature set point, and that's indicated here with the red line. You see that it's flat, uh, and usually it's kind of low. Uh, as, as the weather gets colder, most facilities can relax their chilled water temperature set point, uh, which would be increasing it. And you'll see that shown here with the green line as you move towards the upper left would be showing 
uh, outside air temperature getting colder and the chilled water supply temperature being able to increase. The higher the chilled water set point, you will buy you a lot more hours of plate you can see uh, with your facility load. Uh, in the Southwest, a couple of degrees of chilled water set point can mean a few hundred extra hours of water side economizer operation. Uh, I would point out back to the red line, if your facility really needs 38 or 40 degree chilled water in the middle of the winter, yeah, you're going to have a hard time getting there with your flat plate. Uh, so first, before you optimize your plate, I'd suggest attacking the root cause of those perceived issues for such cold water. Uh, next, th there's, there's a couple of solutions we have for chilled water resets. We've seen a few things that work. Uh, generally, they're based off feedback from chilled water valve positions or chilled water differential pressure requirements, which is really just acting as a proxy for the system cooling needs, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, really, whichever one we see, you kind of see just like the green line shows, the chilled water temperature generally follows outside air temperature. Uh, you know, the, the colder water you need when it's hotter outside. Uh, once you've got a reasonable chilled water temperature set point, you just have to wait for the conditions to be cool enough to transition into economizer mode. Uh, you've got here your wet bulb. Uh, you've also got a tower approach, which is pretty easily to observe in cold conditions. And then you've got a heat exchanger approach, which you can observe as well. Uh, we usually build in some small tolerances of a degree or a degree and a half. I'll add it on to each to make sure that you know you're going to be able to get there. Uh, in this graph, as the wet bulb drops, so kind of moving from the left to the right, uh, the chilled water set point is usually rising due to an effective reset. Uh, you'll want to meet the conditions, uh, as in having enough of your, your offsets and your approaches above the wet bulb for at least a half hour before starting to attempt the mode switch. Uh, you don't want to find yourself in a mild day trying to switch into plate for every cloud that passes over, or you'll end up locked out. When you move into plate, you'll want to stay there for enough time to make it worth the trouble of switching in the first place, uh, preferably overnight or for the duration of a cold snap. Uh, here in the Southwest, in Arizona and Nevada, it's, it's nice to get a couple weeks at a time without mechanical cooling in the dead of winter. In Utah or Colorado, we can see months at a time in winter of flat plate operation. Uh, the key being in both climates, there's significant opportunity in shoulder seasons to transition into flat plate nightly. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to Brian to discuss what to do when you get into flat plate mode. All right. Thanks, Chris. So uh, one of the most common issues that we see with transitioning into flat plate is the chiller search, especially in the system setup that we're going over today with that common condenser water sump. Uh, you know, you have to keep the chillers running and you have to cool off your condenser water at the same time. So you're going to be having really cold condenser water going into those chillers at really low load. And so we see a surge. Every, a lot of times that's the number one reason why things get turned off. Chillers sound really unhappy as condenser water temperatures get colder and colder as you approach flat plate operation. And so just a quick overview. Uh, this is extremely simplified just for, uh, for the sake of argument here. Um, chillers generally have an operating envelope that they're happy to operate in that they were designed to perform. Um, this is, like I said, this is really simplifying. You've got load down there on the bottom horizontal axis and lift, which is just that pressure difference across the compressor. Um, and they're relatively correlated. You want to, you know, have them related a little bit to each other. And what happens is that when your condenser water gets so cold, you lose your lift. Your load's going down because it's getting colder outside, so you just need less cooling. Um, and you are moving from that blue dot up there in the top right in the happy operating envelope down to that red dot, which is outside of your designed operating range. And so the chiller is going to let you know uh, by either doing a run hold or surging or shutting off completely, which is, uh, as we all know, unacceptable. And so one of the methods that we use is a temporary chilled water temperature set point uh, called lift control. And we do this with the chilled water temperature because like we saw in the beginning, there's, no, there's nothing you can do with the condenser water temperature. You need it to get colder. You can't adjust it back up to maintain the lift on the chillers if you wanna make it into flat plate. And so what that lift control does is it controls the lift to maintain the minimum required for the compressor on the chiller to continue to operate. 
Uh, and I say temporary because you don't want your chilled water temperature going down. And that's really what's going to happen here is the chilled water temperature is going to follow the condenser water temperature down as that cools off to maintain the lift on the chiller. And you can run it down to really, really cold. You know, if your chilled water temperature reset might be having you at 50 degrees, but lift control can drive you as cold as something like 38 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's what this graph is showing is as the condenser water temperature drops, as you move into flat plate, your chilled water temperature set point, normally horizontal for you know, the normally operating one, is pushed down temporarily by a fixed offset to maintain chiller operation until your condenser water temperature is cold enough to take over and eliminate mechanical cooling. But with that, now you've just put your system into an uncomfortable operating point where the chilled water temperature is well below its active set point. The lift control, like I said, was temporary and the timers expired once the chiller turns off. So we put in another temporary set point that's effectively demand limiting, and that's what we label it here. And it's a controlled return of the chilled water to its set point. You want to do this over a specified period of time to keep things really stable. Somebody likes instability in the plant. And if you have PID control or trim and respond, you can really set yourself up for failure if your loops aren't compiling because the chilled water is well below its set point, uh, which can just create a bunch of problems going forward. And so this is the ideal operation of the chilled water temperature moving through the mode switch in relation to the condenser water temperature. Here we have kind of what would normally happen without these strategic set points in place. That red line there um, is what would happen without any specific programming to eliminate these issues. You would start your mode switch, your condenser water temperature would get too cold, your chiller would stall, surge, turn off, whatever, and run up, and then you would make it into heat exchanger, maybe, and you'd have to recover. And in that time, your chilled water temperature would be higher than you want, higher than your set points calling for, which in all likelihood would end up with this kind of scenario where you abandon the attempt to get into heat exchanger, your chilled water temperature has been over set point for too long, and your chiller starts on a fail safe. And so, you know, you tried, but you couldn't, just couldn't make it in. And another common thing that we see here is, like I was talking about, if you don't have demand limiting in there to make a controlled return to your normal chilled water temperature set point, you can really peak out your plant and cause some instability. So when your chilled water temperature set point is super cold, everything is gonna relax. Says I'm satisfied with cooling, everything's gonna be running at really minimal capacity. And then all of a sudden your chilled water temperature is gonna come back up to temperature and your entire plant's gonna freak out because it is trying to recover too quickly for too big of a change in, a, in too small amount of time. And that's why exactly why we implement timers and the two temporary chilled water temperature set point resets to make sure that everything goes smoothly and that the equipment operates at a good condition uh, the whole time you're transitioning. All right, so jumping back to me for uh, condenser water control. Uh, condenser water control during the flat plate operation is, is really pretty similar to the flat plate enable criteria that I talked about earlier. Uh, you wanna make tower water as cold as you can get to meet your chilled water temperature set point, but not much colder, because any colder and you'd be wasting energy to get there. Uh, again, you have to account for your heat exchanger approach and your tower approach and uh, the towers target accordingly. Uh, we will note that we've found wet bulb sensors to be particularly finicky. And for this reason, we'll use them for transitions, but we don't like to use them for the set points. Uh, we've seen cooling towers cycling up and down all day chasing wet bulb based set points. So as you kind of see here in the graph, uh, it shows the chilled water temperature set point kind of rising up as temperatures get colder, uh, presumably during a, a heat exchanger onset. And then the, the water side economizer condenser set point 
kind of follows that chilled water temperature set point up. So, you know, it uses the wet bulb line as the trigger to get in. And then once it's in, it follows the chilled water temperature set point with those built-in offsets, like I said, that you can uh, observe pretty easily. The next slide is going to show the, uh, basically the chilled water control during water side economizer mode. So once you've gone through all the lift control and all the demand limiting set points, you basically want to control your chilled water temperature set point uh, the same as you would normal. So you're going to go back to using your reset. Uh, this slide's kind of showing the chilled water temperature during a about a day. Uh, you'll see kind of as the cooling load of the, of the building is high and it drops to low, it'd be going into a night. And then the chilled water temperature set point uh, relaxes, just like we had mentioned before. If you let your reset control based off your needs and you can stay in flat plate mode for multiple days, or multiple weeks, that's great. Uh, as long as you're still able to make that water with your plate, you can happily hum along. Lastly, I did want to uh, go into leaving. So for leaving economizer mode, uh, you got to make sure you have your chilled water temperature above your set point, which we'll go into in the next. Uh, this, this is pretty obvious. Uh, if your plate can't make chilled water cold enough, you need to drop out of economizer mode. Following in on the next ones, is the count. Uh, operating efficiency count is pretty similar to comparative efficiency. You might be good at running your plate to uh, make the chilled water, but if you need that chiller to kick on, it's pretty likely that additional load increase will make it no longer beneficial to run the plate. Uh, comparative efficiency is a good check for economizer mode and transitions. Uh, we have a little quote here. I think it's important to realize that free cooling is not necessarily free. Uh, you still have to run pumps and towers to run a plate. And oftentimes you have to run those harder than you would if you were running a chiller at low load. Uh, some chillers, particularly newer ones, are very efficient operating at low load and low condenser water temperatures, uh, some even under inverted conditions. As it gets warmer, uh, flat plate efficiency will degrade and degrade until you're basically more effective going with mechanical cooling, even during some conditions where your plate could still carry the load. Uh, a little bit for troubleshooting here when you're looking at entering and leaving plate mode, there's always gonna be a little bit of a bump in your overall plant KW. Uh, you wanna minimize that. Uh, if you see your KW per ton bump up, you probably staged too soon and you should have stayed where you were a little bit longer. If you see your KW per ton bump down, you should have staged a little bit earlier. So with that, I'll uh, hand it back to Brian to summarize. Thanks, Chris. So yeah, to wrap it all up, you know, the first step in effectively using a water side economizer is to have a good chilled water temperature reset that's normally operating uh, to really maximize your hours of economizer mode. And, you know, here in the Southwest US, uh, just like Chris said, a couple of degrees on your chilled water temperature can equate to a couple hundred, even a thou over a thousand hours of operation that you're enabling just by allowing the system to only provide the cooling that it needs and not overcool. Uh, using a temporary chilled water temperature set point going into flat plate mode uh, that we call lift control will keep your chillers running at a better operating point until your condenser water temperatures are cold enough to disable any mechanical cooling that you might need. And once you make that switch, you use another temporary chilled water temperature set point that we call demand control to prevent any, we, I mean, we've seen peak uh, utility bill peaks get set coming out of water side economizer because things just get out of whack and everything turns on when it shouldn't. And so using a controlled method to get back to your normally operating chilled water temperature set point it's really the most effective way to do it and eases the eases that mode switch. Once you've made it to plate, you want to ease onto it as best you can. And then uh, when economizer is no longer the most efficient operating mode, get out of it. You know, obviously there's going to be fail safes and that kind of stuff on equipment count and chill water temperature set point. But, uh, you know, like Chris said, depending on your chiller, depending on your plant, maybe it won't be as efficient to run three cooling towers on a economizer when you can just click on one chiller and one cooling tower. And so I think that sums it up pretty well, but if you have any specific things that you want answered or some things you want to share, 
here is our contact information. You can email both Chris and myself, and we'd be more than happy to hear from you. Thank you.